Mafia originally referred to a very specific type of organized crime entity that emerged in Sicily, but which eventually expanded into Italy and beyond. The primary activities of this original mafia included protection rackets along the lines of, this is a nice store you've got here, it would be a shame if anything were to happen to it, but they also tended to be involved in gambling, loan sharking, drug trafficking, prostitution, and other industries that fell outside the realm of legal behavior in their area. So they tended to invest themselves anywhere where their muscle and willingness to act outside the law and their relationships and reputation would allow them to profitably insert themselves as middlemen to skim some of the resources from that particular activity. The mafia label has in more recent times been applied to other groups and other cultures that operate according to similar principles and business models. In Japan, they have the Yakuza. In Russia, they have the Bratva. But there are variations on this theme pretty much everywhere, and the complexity of their schemes and manipulations have grown increasingly complex and intermingled with the law and politics and religion and essentially every other aspect of society as well. This intertwining, of course, is part of what allows such group to operate with, if not complete, impunity, with at least a high level of indemnity from the law. Their activities garner resources, and resources pretty much everywhere can help a person or a group gain access to privileges that others don't have access to. A mob boss, then, can be at the center of countless violent crimes, but the FBI might have trouble ever getting enough evidence and witnesses together, enough witnesses that survive to testify at trial at least, to build a strong case. The boss of a Chicago-based mafia-like syndicate called the Chicago Outfit, Al Capone, sometimes called Scarface, was famously put in prison for tax evasion back in 1931. The United States government tried and tried to catch him on the many, many deplorable crimes that he was known to have committed, but they could never get enough to make it stick. And Capone was connected enough through bribes and threats and more traditional business world relationships and lobbying efforts that he could not be easily touched. And they didn't want to take a legal shot at him and miss because that would make it more difficult to get him the next time that they tried to bring him in. As a consequence, Capone and others like him live in bubbles of immense privilege of a kind unattainable by most people. And those privileges become more refined and enhanced over time because of the relationships that such people are able to build with other mafia-like entities, with politicians, and with otherwise legitimate business people. Privilege, in other words, breeds privilege. The Matthew effect, which in practice says that those who have power tend to accrue more power and way faster than the average person because of that power that they already have, that those with wealth tend to accrue more wealth and way faster than the average person, and that those who are famous tend to get more famous and way faster than the average person because of the benefits gained from their existing fame. That effect definitely applies here. Those with privilege derived from these sorts of resources, from this sort of network, from these sorts of relationships, tend to gain more of the same and at a far faster pace than the rest of us and on a scale that is unlikely to be attainable by anyone without those same relationships. What I want to talk about today is this type of network, and how even within the limits of the law, it's possible for people in such positions with these sorts of beneficial relationships and advantageous starting points to establish themselves as centers of gravity in any space that they might choose to enter. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show, and if you're enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also contribute monetarily via PayPal and Venmo and platforms of that variety. You can find a link to those options at letsnotethings.com. And also very helpful is leaving a quick review wherever you get your podcasts. 
These reviews and the sharing of your favorite episode with a friend or with your social network of choice are one of the best ways to bring in new listeners, and I very much appreciate this type of effort. Thanks very much to everyone who's already contributed in some way, monetary or non-monetary, and thanks in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I want to start with today comes from the New York Times, and it's entitled, We Know Them, We Trust Them, Uber and Airbnb Alumni Fuel Tech's Next Wave. Let's establish some context here before we dive into this one. Airbnb is a famously successful unicorn tech company, meaning a tech company worth over a billion dollars. It was actually valued at somewhere in the neighborhood of $35 billion in early 2019, though internal valuations are said to be closer to $38 billion. That lower number was used for the purposes of making a recent acquisition. They bought the hotel booking platform Hotel Tonight, so there's a chance that they erred lower than usual, circumstantially because that lower value then determined how much they paid out in Airbnb stock to the shareholders of Hotel Tonight when the acquisition went through. In any case, Airbnb is a tech world success story that, rumor has it, is planning to go public to make shares of the company available on the common market as common stocks sometime in 2019, perhaps in June, but perhaps later in the year. What tends to happen when a company like Airbnb goes public is that employees, many of whom, as is common in the tech world, are offered stocks or stock options of some kind as part of their sign-on bonus or paycheck, is that a flurry of employees who were earning six-figure salaries are suddenly worth a few million dollars or more, and that money, those millions, tied up in company ownership, suddenly becomes liquid, something that they can act on, exchange for money, selling it as stock, as soon as the company goes public. Up until that point, they are sitting on shares of the company that are far more difficult to divest because of the nature of that type of asset. Recent history has shown that when this happens, when these assets become liquid, are more easily sellable, a flurry of employees leave the company, flush with money, to start up their own new things. Maybe a new invention or product, maybe a new company. Whatever the specifics, there are a bunch of smart, capable, newly wealthy people suddenly able to consider leaving their jobs if they want to, and a lot of them do. This New York Times piece is about a 30-something tech world investor who was running an investment fund with middling results, only to pivot towards something more specific, investing in former Airbnb employees. And even more specifically, he was getting all the pieces into place to invest in a large number of these newly minted millionaires who will probably quit their jobs at Airbnb if and when the company goes public. A moment when these people will be thinking about their next steps and will be the most likely to take risks. Because financially, they're in a good place and they've been doing the same thing over and over every day for a while. So it's potentially time for a change. So this investor refocused his fund toward making money available to the very specific category of entrepreneur who will be leaving Airbnb after the company goes public, assuming that it does, and it's a fair bet that it will, and relatively soonish. The subtext here, though, goes further than just these particular individuals. As mentioned in the piece, part of why this group of people, these ex-employees of a particular company, are so appealing to investors is that they are not just individuals who are capable and financially secure and smart. They are a group, a network of such people. In other words, they are not just ex-Airbnb employees. They are, potentially at least, a network of ex-Airbnb employees. And in some ways, based on past tech world post-IPO migrations of this kind at least, if you bet on one such employee, you are also sort of betting on all of them. And if you bet big on many of them, that in turn increases the potential that at least some of your bets will pay off in a big way. There is precedent for this type of thinking in the tech world. In 1957, a group of employees who became known as the Traitorous Eight quit their jobs at Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory to collectively found the company Fairchild Semiconductor, 
These employees left for a variety of reasons, but core to their departure was the authoritarian managerial style of William Shockley, their boss, and the fact that his work at this lab was not proving to be as fruitful or innovative as they had all hoped. The company they worked together to found after leaving Fairchild Semiconductor was itself very innovative and successful, though, and it went on to become the nucleus of what eventually became Silicon Valley. It incubated, invested in, or was otherwise directly involved in the emergence of numerous companies, including Intel and AMD. And these are foundational companies that developed a lot of the tech that the rest of Silicon Valley, even if just adjacently, became dependent on. The eight, as they became known in Silicon Valley circles, eventually went on to do some impressive things individually, from writing the first comprehensive textbook on integrated circuits, to developing and refining RFID tags, to founding a series of specialized electronics companies, to developing the technology that enabled the emergence of Japanese electronic watches. Most of the eight also funded various founders and companies along the way, spreading not just their time and energy, but also their resources and connections to new arrivals in the tech industry. And all throughout their careers, they benefited from their shared connection, their shared network of contacts and reputations and resources. They were more powerful individually because of who they were collectively. A more recent version of this same model the tight-knit network of people who leave a company and then go on to do notable things, those things being possible at least in part because of that in-group that they're a part of, is evident in the so-called PayPal Mafia, a group of former PayPal employees who went on to found and develop a huge array of companies, including Tesla, SpaceX, LinkedIn, Palantir, YouTube, Yelp, and Yammer, along with their early investments in Facebook, Friendster, Zynga, Flickr, Dig, Congregate, and nearly a thousand other small to massive, mostly tech companies. The most well-known members of this group, outside of Silicon Valley at least, are probably Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, but some members, like Max Levchin, are some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley due to their influence, connections, and the huge sums of money that they bestow upon tech companies at different phases of their existence. They are successful kingmakers and highly sought out and respected as a consequence. Now, one thing that stands out, if you look at the photos of these two groups especially, the Traitorous Eight and the PayPal Mafia, is that there are not any women in either group. There also aren't any older faces. The Eight were all part of the same age demographic around their 30s and 40s, and the PayPal Mafia was the same, though they were mostly in their 20s and 30s when they got started. And there are few non-white faces in either group. And you could respond to this by saying, well, so what? And fair enough, any particular random group of people will not necessarily be representative of the population as a whole. But the composition of such groups becomes more relevant, I would argue, when those groups also control massive amounts of power and influence. So I'm not noting that homogeneity here to shame them for not being more inclusive, but rather to point out that there is homogeneity there. And because of the power that these groups wield, the influence they have had and continue to have over so many aspects of technology and business and culture, it's prudent to point out that their point of views may not be as diverse and therefore their influences might nudge these aspects of society more in some directions than others. And that has many potential ramifications, but one example is the question of who the kingmakers tend to make into kings. There's research that indicates that we tend to be partial, all else being equal, to folks who are similar to us. Not in the I hate people who are not like me sense, but in the purely subconscious tiny differences in how we treat people here and there, which ideas we think are brilliant and novel and which we presuppose to be nonsense. And people at the top of power pyramids have more potential to favor and oppose other people based on anything or nothing at all than the rest of us do. And their favoring, in turn, has more impact because of who they are and the group that they are a part of. Put a tight-knit network of people who are similar in many ways at the top of many different pyramids then, and you can see how that might amplify any accidental subconscious biases that might be present within that intellectual subculture, especially over a period of decades, as those small choices, those tiny biases, aggregate into secondary and tertiary consequences. Now again, I do not bring this up as criticism, but rather to illustrate how favoritism can be implemented without it being a prejudiced choice in the way we might commonly use the word prejudice. 
Yes, there is an insane amount of bias in any industry, typically toward the sorts of people and solutions that lead to more success, according to the metrics that are favored within that industry. But generally, those metrics are determined by the people at the top. And those people may have a limited perspective beyond the range of things that made them good at the work that got them to the top in the first place. So it may be that the favoring of certain personality types actually makes sense because of the outcomes that tend to emerge when these sorts of people enter into that particular industry. But it may also be that a person making those choices, defining good and bad and what that looks like in that industry, is making assumptions about what will work and what won't work based on their own narrow collection of experiences. And as a consequence, they will then favor a certain personality type for subjective rather than objective reasons. Although to them, and those who are similar to them in personality type, these favorings may seem to be objective because of that shared perspective. It just makes sense to them because it makes sense within their worldview based on that narrow subjective collection of experiences. The people who control the resources in any space will tend to have their own internal algorithms, their own heuristics, their own mental shortcuts for figuring out what will work best. And in a lot of cases, due to survivorship bias, which causes us to look at those who made it and assume that they must have done everything right, rather than assuming that they just happened to luck out and survive all of the filters that were placed along the way, because of that, they may look at themselves and say, well, cool, I'm good at this, I did well, according to the metrics that matter, so let's find more people like me. And all along the way, they might ignore the fact that they potentially decided some of those metrics. They perhaps had advantages that allowed them to succeed, despite not being optimal, according to many other types of metrics, for the work or the job or whatever else in question. And once you're at the top, it's fairly simple to ignore the fact that one example of something does not make a trend or an ideal, because other people around you who want you to make them into kings as the kingmaker will tend to reinforce your specific worldview because of what they believe you can do for them, if they do. And all of this is why, when we look at mafia-like groups of people, none of which individually have any but the best of intentions, we can still be concerned by their homogeneity. A lack of diversity of people, of backgrounds, of ways of thinking, of economic situation, of range of experience, including rural versus urban, national versus international, and faith-based versus secular. This lack of diversity can mean everyone and everything in that space will be filtered through their worldview, which will in turn, potentially at least, reduce the points of view considered, the metrics that we use to gauge success, and the sorts of people who tend to thrive, or at the very least who are provided with latent advantages from on high within these spaces. Anyone who doesn't fit within that schema that they determine, then, faces a sort of soft pushback, a subtle collection of nearly invisible disadvantages. In Silicon Valley, there's an enthusiasm for risk-taking, for certain types of bravado and swagger and the ability to sell oneself. There's a pride taken in the work-hard, play-hard sort of lifestyle, and a general acceptance, if not encouragement of, asking for forgiveness rather than permission. Or phrased another way, to steal a famous motivational quote from the walls of Facebook's HQ, there is a cultural favoritism for moving fast and breaking things rather than the alternative. All of which are ideas we can find throughout society, but when they become the highly refined centers of a particular culture, set in place by a small in-group that wields vast amounts of wealth and influence and other types of leverage, they can become not just troublesome, but they can also distort foundational systems meant to maintain a meritocratic system. They can create closed advantage networks that are accessible only to the few at the expense of the many. Let's sidestep for a moment into what might initially seem like a somewhat random tangent, but which actually ties back to this main storyline in an interesting way. These past few weeks, as of the day I'm recording this at least, the headlines of newspapers around the world have been flooded with news of a scandal that shook some Ivy League universities here in the United States, which began when it became publicly known that 50 people in six states were accused by the U.S. Justice Department of cheating their kids into these high-end prestigious institutions in a variety of colorful ways. 
Some kids were branded as athletes, accepted into the college to play on a team, despite never having been much of a player, or in some cases never having played the sport that they were supposedly being accepted to play at a college level at all. Others were falsely diagnosed with learning disabilities to give them advantages on standardized tests, giving them access, mid-test, to accomplices who would help them field the tough questions, while others had the tests taken for them by professional test takers who could get any grade on an SAT, depending on what the client, in this case these parents, wanted for their kids. Part of the reason this scandal grabbed headlines was that the methods employed were so outlandish that it seemed almost farcical. It didn't hurt, too, that the parents involved included celebrities and many wealthy and well-connected public personalities. I think if we're being honest with ourselves, there was a certain amount of schadenfreude taking place. Those of us without wealth and high-end connections got to feel a little bit vindicated by these reports of people who are higher up the economic totem pole than us, finally getting caught doing some of the shady things that we've always suspected they do. But the macro story here is that some people with power were able to acquire accolades for their children, acceptance to Ivy League schools that they presumably would not have gained admittance to without their parents' help, in order to give their kids advantages over other kids. Which is really not a new thing. It's something that parents have tried to do for their kids, for their kin, for their dynasties in some cases pretty much since the beginning of the concept of social status. We want our offspring to be healthy, successful, happy. We want them to have things better than we did in most cases. And one way to do that is to make sure they have academic credentials. But it's nowhere near the only way. This is just one circumstance in which a very small number of people attempting these sorts of things happen to be caught. But all day, every day, there are parents worldwide attempting to achieve the same by hiring mentors and tutors, by buying ACT test prep courses, by reading to their kids every day, and on the higher end of things, by paying for new facilities for schools which will bear the name of the donating family and smooth the way for their kids to gain access whenever they like. Standardized tests and other university acceptance filtering mechanisms are meant to serve as sieves to ensure that we as a society are more likely to invest certain finite resources in the right place where they're best served, which in this case is meant to mean where they are most meritocratically served. Those who deserve by these criteria are meant to benefit from those educational resources that we pool as a society. And ostensibly, at least, these systems are meant to cast a blind eye to all other attributes so they can focus exclusively on those specific socially favored merits. Any system can be gamed, though. And although there isn't good evidence to support this that I'm aware of, at least, it would be a difficult thing to measure, it does seem that the longer a filtering mechanism exists, the longer a credibility-boosting award or scholarship or VIP-style mechanism is in place, the more likely it is that someone has gamed it, has either captured it completely or adjusted it so that they and their ilk have some kind of advantage over everyone else when it comes to divvying out those rewards, those advantages. And after a certain point, that gaming, that rigging of the system, becomes itself systematized for those who can afford it, in terms of money, influence, or other sorts of power. The gatekeepers gotta eat too. And in a lot of cases, as with this college admissions scandal, it's easy to justify cracking the door to let a few potential unworthies, by some standards, the public-facing standards, through that seemingly impassable barrier. If that'll help the school pay a professor for a year, or keep the campus grounds clean, or build a new research facility, or if it'll benefit you personally as one of the gatekeepers in control of the relevant keys. What this setup leads to is a system in which privilege leads to more privilege. Kids who grow up with certain advantages tend to benefit from an ever-expanding number of advantages as they grow older because the wealth their parents wield will gain them not just consistent health care and tutors and financially secure lifestyles, but also potentially access to Ivy League schools that they would not have otherwise been accepted to on their own academic merits. Likewise, if you get in with the right job in the world of tech, 
Not only do you benefit from the job itself and the possible ladder climbing that you can do within the company or within the other similar nearby companies that you can jump to as you grow as a professional, you also benefit from the prestige of working at such places, the benefits of making a larger than average income, and later, potentially, the privileges accorded to those who work at such companies at the right time, who benefit from successful IPOs, and all the extra resources and reputation that come with that. The network effect typically compounds the benefits of a network based on the size of that network. But in these cases, the benefit of the network is found in keeping it small and focused, made up of people with similar attributes with greater than average access, resources, and prestige. And tribing up in this way allows focuses of different types of power to acquire more power faster than those who do not start out with the same. It amplifies the Matthew effect for those who already benefit from it. Now, importantly, this is not an inherently negative or positive thing. Such power can be used to manipulate university systems or to invent the next great whatever. But it is a thing, and it's a thing that can be perceived in different ways depending on what sorts of privilege we happen to be talking about and depending on where we stand personally in relation to that privilege. We could focus, for instance, on the subjective unfairness of these systems which I think is totally justified in a lot of cases, especially in situations where public money is in some way being reallocated to the already advantaged few at the expense of those with relatively fewer advantages, at least in some cases, like those where universities receive public funds, and those funds are then spent in part on students whose parents cheated them into the system, like a cuckoo bird sneaking its eggs into the nest of another bird, tricking it into providing for the cuckoo's young. This is something that feels very wrong in many ways to many people, and perhaps rightfully so. We could also, though, take a lesson from this knowledge and ask ourselves how we might use our own advantages. And everyone has some advantage that someone else does not have, even if it isn't as obvious as having money or social privilege or powerful friends. We can ask ourselves how we might use those advantages to empower ourselves and others, and benefit from the advantages held by those others in the trade-off. How we might, in other words, create these sorts of communities and networks to amplify the things and people that we care about, rather than sitting around and worrying over what these other people are doing, things they have little reason to stop doing, and things that give them increasing power and advantages over us. We could try to create our own networks to see if it does anything to balance the books. This is arguably something that's already being done within many different public spheres right now, from the world of so-called identity politics to the world of mastermind groups, where a collection of entrepreneurs or writers or whatever else will work together to try to build a shared and amplified influence group of their own, for their own collective, in a very limited sort of way, but for the greater good of the people in that group. We could question the concept of meritocracy in general and wonder if it's even possible to create purely meritocratic systems or whether they will inevitably succumb to this sort of manipulation and favoritism, whether we're talking about the tech world, the world of education, or any other space in which these privileged spirals tend to take place, which is pretty much all of them, depending on how you measure such things and through which lens you happen to be looking through. This is an especially prudent question in places like the United States, where a huge part of our cultural mythology revolves around the notion that if you are rich, it's because you earned it, and if you're poor, it's because you earned it. It's possible, I think, to have a system that is beneficial in many ways, but perhaps not beneficial in the ways that it purports to be beneficial. I'm not necessarily saying that's the case here, and I'm definitely not saying it's always the case, even in any particular country or within any particular system. But it's an idea worth exploring, I think, as it could influence our perception of everything from how we legislate to how our culture is portrayed in things like literature and film. There's a meme that I've seen popping up with increased frequency on Twitter of late. It's posted pretty much every time some new perceived abuse by the wealthy and influential comes to light. And it was definitely pretty active after the recent Ivy League academic scandal. The meme involves posting the headline to this type of story, along with a comment about it being time to invest in guillotine futures, an allusion to the French Revolution, where to flatten a complex historical moment pretty dramatically, the aristocracy were executed in the streets using guillotines in order to redistribute the wealth and power that they had acquired to the people, those who had not been able to share in all of that wealth and power because of how the system was set up. 
Now, I don't think anyone really wants that kind of future today on either side of those potential guillotines, but if we can't figure out ways to ameliorate the most inequitable excesses emerging from these privilege cycles, I suspect folks on all sides of this conversation could have cause to wonder at some point in the relatively near future where we might have paused, assessed, and come up with the means of balancing the privileged books before those books were more forcefully and dramatically rebalanced. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, you might also enjoy some of my other work. You can find a complete list of the books that I have written, which are available in paperback and ebook, and many of them in audiobook format at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find my advice column about life at some thoughtsaboutliving.com. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called How to Hide an Empire, A History of the Greater United States by Daniel Immerwar. This book jumped out at me when I saw the topic. It's essentially about colonization and empire building by the United States and why the U.S. empire looks very, very, very different from empires made by colonizers of the past. And there are an abundance of different reasons for this. And part of why I loved this book so much is that it gets into these different reasons in a fairly deep and detailed way, talking about things like the technologies that emerged and the shipping processes that emerged that allowed the United States to build what the author calls a pointillist empire with a bunch of little bases all around the world, as opposed to owning territory and land elsewhere the way that prior empires needed to do. It talks about some of the other technologies like synthetics that came around that allowed us to not have to colonize, at least not for very long, because we didn't need the colonies for their resources. We could make them at home. And it talks about a lot of the politics behind it as well and the changes in perception of what it was to be an empire and how that started out as something that was pretty cool, especially for the people who were in the empires, to be able to consider themselves to be above these other people, and how that became not such a good thing progressively as the 20th century rolled forward. And it actually became a way to distinguish oneself from one's enemies to point out that one was not trying to capture other people's countries, even though in practice, you might still be taking power and authority over those countries just in somewhat different ways than countries might have done in the past. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, if you'd like to learn about the territories that the United States still holds and how that relationship works, and when the states became states and some of the people who came from those states, and how the U.S. and their formalizing and distributing of a very particular standard for how a screw is made, among many other things, led to our ability to create a pointillist empire in the 20th century, you might consider checking out How to Hide an Empire by Daniel Immerwar. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find out more about the speaking tour that I'm currently on at becomingtour.com, and you can find my advice column about life at somethoughtsaboutliving.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on your social network of choice. I am at Colin is my name on most of them, but just Colin Wright on Facebook. Thank you so very much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.